a very good evening aspirants i welcome you all to the hindu daily news analysis brought to you by shankarayas academy for the date 25th of february 2023 before getting into discussion i have an exciting announcement to the aspirants who are going to give 2023 upsc prelims starting from tomorrow every sunday the discussion video of previous year questions will be posted in our channel instead of daily news analysis as you all know previous year questions are very much important when it comes to prelims so this initiative will help you to analyze the trend of upsc questions use this opportunity and revise well and most importantly you need not worry about sunday's news analysis the important news articles from the sunday's hindu newspaper will be clubbed with the newspaper analysis on monday and tuesday this is what i wanted to convey to you now look at these articles these are the articles that we are going to discuss today you can go through it now let's get into our first news article discussion now for our first discussion we are going to take this news article this article is from opinion page now don't think that this article is very big it is actually about a known problem yes it is about the thermal power plants the article explains the ill effects of thermal power plants through the life experience of mr madhav mundada mr madhav explained how the thermal power plant when he was a kid and how it is now this is why the article is so big See Mr Madhav shared his experience about the Chandrapur super thermal power station in Maharashtra's Chandrapur district. Now in our discussion today we are not going to see the life experience of Mr Madhav instead we are going to see about thermal power plants generally. Now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can pass the video and go through it. First of all we will understand what is a thermal power plant. See in simple words a thermal power plant is a power plant that uses heat energy to produce electric power since the power plant uses heat energy to produce electric power it got the name thermal power plant now how does thermal power plants work to know that now look at this image here now first i will tell you the basics of the working principle of thermal power plants and then we will understand from this image see in thermal power plant the heat energy obtained from combustion of solid fuel is used to convert water into steam this steam is used to rotate the turbine blade then the turbine blade which is attached to the turbine shaft will connect to the generator and finally the generator converts the kinetic energy of the turbine impeller into the electric energy now look at this image see first of all a solid fuel is fed into the boiler furnace usually the solid fuel will be coal only so coal will be fed to the boiler furnace and this is called combustion chamber see air will be provided to the chamber to aid the combustion now the boiler here will be filled with water after the combustion starts the heat will be transferred to the water which in turn will form steam this steam will be at high pressure and at high temperature now the steam will go to the turbine and the flue gases from combustion will be let out in some cases the heat in the flue gas will be utilized to preheat the water before sending it to the boiler but in some cases it will be let out after some treatment this only we call it as greenhouse gas emissions because the flue gases contains carbon dioxide now coming to the steam the steam will go to the turbine know that a turbine is a mechanical device which converts the kinetic and pressure energy of steam into useful work in turbine the steam expands and loses its kinetic and pressure energy and rotates the turbine blade this in turn will rotate the turbine shaft which is connected to the turbine blades the turbine shaft then rotates the generator which converts this kinetic energy into electrical energy now we got the electricity we need this electricity will be transmitted to different places based on the demand know that the used steam is cooled and let out the used steam is cooled in the cooling tower to remove any residual heat and finally the water vapor is released into the atmosphere and this is all about the working mechanism of thermal power plants i hope you understand it having seen about the thermal power plants and its working mechanism now let's move on to see about the factors that determines the location of thermal power plants see there are many factors let us see them one by one the first and foremost factor is the availability of fuel here we can also say the availability of coal This is because coal is only used in most of the thermal power plants. See huge amount of coal is required for the generation of electricity in thermal power plants. So thermal power plants should be located near coal mines or near the ports. 
I am saying ports here because imported coal can arrive easily if thermal power plants is located near ports. This is about the first factor that is the availability of fuel. Then the second factor is availability of water. Just now we saw water is only converted to steam, right? So we need water for the functioning of thermal power plants. We also need water for cooling purposes also. So thermal power plants should be located near water sources. This is about the second factor that is the availability of water. Then the third factor is land. Know that the average land required per megawatt capacity is 3 to 4 hectares. So there should be land available in case of expansion of thermal power plant. Additionally, the land should have good bearing capacity. Here bearing capacity literally means the capacity of the land to support the loads applied to the ground. Okay. This is about the third factor that is the land. Now coming to the fourth factor, it is transport facilities. See thermal power plants should have the transportation facility such as road and rail for transportation of material and machinery. So good transportation means should be there near thermal power plants. This is about the fourth factor that is transport facilities. Now coming to the fifth factor, fifth factor is proximity to load center. See the thermal power plant should be located near to load center to create minimize the transmission cost of electrical energy. Okay. See all these factors that we saw now are economic factors. Some non-economic factors are also there. Now we will see them one by one. Firstly, the thermal power plant should be away from the densely populated area. This is because thermal power plant produces smoke and fumes by burning a huge amount of coal. This pollutes the atmosphere and causes many breathing diseases to the people. Therefore, thermal power plant should be located at considerable distance from populated area. Secondly, proper disposal facilities should be there near thermal power plants. See, ash produced after burning of coal is about 20 to 40 percentage of the weight of the coal. This ash causes serious health problems and it is a highly corrosive when it is in hot condition. So proper disposal facilities should be there near the thermal power plants. And these are the factors that determine the location of thermal power plants. And this map here shows some of the major thermal power plants in India. Pause the video and just go through it. Now before concluding our discussion, we will see about the advantages and disadvantages of thermal power plants. See thermal power plants are famous because the cost of generation of power is very cheap when compared to other methods of power generation and the fuel usage is also very cheap. Apart from this, the initial installation cost is also very less when compared to other power generation methods. So less cost is the first advantage. Secondly, the thermal power plants requires less space when compared to hydro power plants. Okay, this is the second advantage. Thirdly, thermal power plants has the location advantage. See, location advantage is not the case in hydro power plants and solar power plants and windmills and all. If there is a good transportation facility, then anything can be brought to the location. But it is not the case in hydro, wind and solar power plants. See, we cannot transfer the water, wind and solar energy, right? So thermal power plants have a location advantage. Finally, there are reliable sources of energy. According to the demand, the load can be changed frequently without any difficulty. But when it comes to renewable energy, they are seasonal. So demand supply mismatch will be there. But this is not a problem with the thermal power plants. So thermal power plants are reliable sources of energy. See these are all some of the advantages of thermal power plants. Now moving on to see about the disadvantages associated with thermal power plants. Firstly, the major disadvantage is pollution caused by thermal power plants. We saw that combustion of coal leads to the emission of greenhouse gases, right? This pollutes the atmosphere and causes global warming also. So the first disadvantage is pollution. Secondly, even though the installation cost is low in the thermal power plants, the maintenance and operating cost is high when compared with other power generation methods. Thirdly, the use of fossil fuels causes the depletion of natural resources. We all know coal comes under the category of non-renewable resources, right? So the use of fossil fuels will tend to deplete the natural resources. Fourthly, thermal power plants require huge amounts of water. As we saw earlier, thermal power plants require a large amount of water to produce steam that can drive the turbines to produce electricity. This huge amount of water causes a serious impact on water sources in rivers, lakes, groundwater, etc. So the requirement of huge amounts of water is also another disadvantage. Finally, thermal power plants have low efficiency and low lifespan. Okay. 
and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is thermal power plants then we saw about how thermal power plants are working then we moved on to see about the factors that determining the location of thermal power plants in india and finally we saw some advantages and disadvantages associated with thermal power plants see this topic is very much important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article says that four police officers have been suspended for accepting bribes from a gang that was smuggling at least eight orangutans i hope you all remember about the orange juice from the movie life of pi see in the movie life of pi the orangutan played a role as orange juice now today in our discussion let us understand few facts about orangutans from an exam perspective see the name orangutan means man of the forest in the malay language as the name suggests these long haired orange juice primates are almost exclusively arboreal that is the orangutans arrival by moving from one tree to another and usually avoid climbing down to the ground know that orangutans are world's largest tree climbing mammals they are highly intelligent and are close relatives of humans usually people call orangutans as the gardeners of the forest this is because they play a vital role in seed dispersal and in maintaining the health of the forest ecosystem these services are crucial for both people and a variety of other animals like sumatran rhinos asian elephants and tigers so conserving the orangutan's habitat is very important to conserve other endangered species now let us see about physical features of orangutans see orangutans have a characteristic ape like shape shaggy reddish fur and grasping hands and feet they have powerful arms that are stronger and longer than their legs their arms can reach 2 meter in length and it is long enough to touch their ankles when they stand now talking about the social character of orangutans orangutans make a nest of vegetation to sleep in at night and they rest in smaller nests during the day know that orangutans are more solitary than other apes adult males are generally hostile to one another as they move through the forest they make plenty of rumbling and howling calls to ensure that they stay out of each other's way note that the long call can be heard even 1.2 miles away however male orangutans large home ranges overlap with the ranges of several adult females orangutans can live up to 50 years in the wild females first reproduce between 10 to 15 years of age they give birth at most once every 5 years and the interval between babies can be as long as 10 years orangutans usually give birth to single young or occasionally twins orangutans stay with their mothers for the first 7 to 11 years of their life an infant orangutan rides on its mother's body and sleeps in her nest until it is able to survive on its own here note that the long time taken to reach sexual maturity the long interbirth periods and the fact that orangutans normally give birth to just a single young means that orangutans have an extremely low reproductive rate this makes orangutan populations highly vulnerable to excessive mortality and the population takes a longer time to recover from population declines now talking about the diet of orangutans about 60% of the orangutans diet includes fruits such as durians jackfruit lychees mangosteens mangoes and figs the rest diet comprises young leaves and shoots insects soil tree bark woody lianas and occasionally eggs and small vertebrates know that orangutans obtain water not only from fruit but also from tree holes okay this is about diet of orangutans now talking about the species of orangutan there are three species of orangutan they are the bornean the sumatran and the recently confirmed new species the tapunuli see these great apes are only found in the wild on the islands of borneo and sumatra currently all these three orangutan species are categorized as critically endangered under the iucn red list of threatened species now talking about the threats to orangutans habitat loss due to forest fire then conversion of forests to oil palm plantations and other agricultural developments are the main cause of orangutans population decline and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about orangutans then we saw about the characteristics of orangutans then we moved on to see about social character of the orangutans 
then we saw about the diet of orangutans and finally we saw some points regarding the species of orangutan and the threats see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now see this snippet displayed here the news is that our defense minister has attended the convocation ceremony of vishwa bharati university in the convocation speech the defense minister spoke about the humanism and the contribution of the vishwa bharati university's founder rabindranath tagore this is what is given in this small article now in this context let us learn some points about rabindranath tagore from an exam perspective see rabindranath tagore was born in calcutta in the year 1861 he was the youngest of the 13 children born to his parents know that rabindranath tagore's family was one of the richest families of calcutta at that time this provided rabindranath tagore with opportunities to study a wide variety of subjects from his childhood days itself tagore was home schooled for most of his initial years where he learned subjects like astronomy history mathematics philosophy etc other than academics tagore was also interested in music and songwriting all these factors combined together to make tagore a polymath in his later years see the term polymath refers to an individual whose knowledge spans a wide number of subjects now coming back at the age of 17 tagore moved to england for higher studies after a brief stay at london tagore moved back to india to look after his father's estate from then tagore increasingly started participating in the public activities he opened a public ashram in shantiniketan which is now presently located in the state of west bengal this is where tagore published geetanjali in english here note that the text geetanjali is a collection of poems written by tagore this publication has resulted in tagore winning the nobel prize for literature in the year 1913 also know that rabindranath tagore was the first non european to win the nobel prize and subsequently in the year 1915 tagore was awarded knighthood by king george v to appreciate the good works done by rabindranath tagore know that rabindranath tagore returned the knighthood 4 years later in the year 1919 as a mark of protest against the jallianwala bag massacre okay this is all about rabindranath tagore now let us see about some of the important works done by rabindranath tagore as we all know the present indian national anthem janagana mana was penned by rabindranath tagore apart from this amar sona bangla which is now the national anthem of bangladesh was also penned by rabindranath tagore also know that the present national anthem of sri lanka was also inspired by rabindranath tagore's work so these are all some of the important contributions made by rabindranath tagore now before ending our discussion let us see a few points regarding the ideology of rabindranath tagore see the present discussions about internationalism taking over nationalism had been previously discussed by rabindranath tagore in his writings See Rabindranath Tagore was a staunch believer in humanism and he always put forward the idea of peaceful coexistence as the end goal of human existence. This particular feature of Rabindranath Tagore's writings was only highlighted by our defense minister in the convocation speech yesterday. Okay? And that's all regarding this discussion. This discussion we saw about Rabindranath Tagore and we saw about the contributions of Rabindranath Tagore. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article talks about Gaganyaan mission. Now suddenly it is in news because yesterday the Hyderabad based Manjira Mission Builders handed over the first indigenous simulated crew module to the director of Vikrabai Space Center in Tiruvannadapuram. So in this backdrop let us learn few facts about Gaganyaan mission. See the word Gaganyaan is derived from Sanskrit which means sky vehicle. Now that Gaganyaan mission was launched by the ISRO and it aims to send three person crew to space. So Gaganyaan is an indigenous mission that would take Indian astronauts to the space. The Gaganyaan mission was announced by the Prime Minister of India on Independence Day in 2018. Okay? This is a brief about Gaganyaan. Now talking about the objectives of the Gaganyaan mission. See Gaganyaan mission's principal goal is to demonstrate the technology The Gaganyaan program will rely on Indian companies for 60 to 70 percentage of its components and value added services. So this will boost the science and technology and the scientific temper of the country. Apart from this, other institutes, academia and industry will also be involved in this Gaganyaan mission. 
so it will encourage the youth to take on challenges in the field of science and technology and finally this mission also strives to deliver developed technology for the betterment of society and further human resource development so this mission will make a path to international collaboration and betterment of policies now talking about the technical details see the gaganyaan system module is going to carry three indian astronauts including a woman to the space the module will circle the earth at a low earth orbit at an altitude of 300 to 400 km from earth for 5 to 7 days this is about the mission now talking about the payloads the payload of gaganyaan system will consist of two modules first is the crew module this is the module which is going to carry human beings and the second one is the service module so it is a propulsion module which is powered by two liquid propellant engines apart from this gaganyaan system module will also equipped with emergency escape and emergency mission abort systems okay this is about the payloads now which launch vehicle is going to launch gaganyaan mission so it is gslv mk3 which is also called as lmv3 that is launch vehicle mark 3 will be used to launch gaganyaan now that gslv mk3 that is geo satellite launch vehicle mark 3 is a three staged heavy lift launch vehicle of isro now that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about gaganyaan mission then we saw about the objectives of the gaganyaan mission then we moved on to see about the payloads of the mission and finally we saw some facts about the launch vehicle that is going to launch gaganyaan mission now these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial here this article deals with the issue of cyber security it further talks about the recent increasing trend of cyber attacks in india then it further highlights indian government's response to cyber attacks in india other than these various global mechanisms to curb cyber security threats and the problems associated with cyber security frameworks are also discussed in this editorial finally the author of the editorial wants india's presidency of g20 to create a global framework of common minimum acceptance for cyber security this is the overall crux of the article given here now in this context let us learn about the term cyber security and then we will see the points provided in this editorial now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can pass the video and go through it now first let's start with the term cyber security see the term cyber security refers to the security standards which are required to protect any type of information which is stored in the online medium from malicious attacks see protecting the data which is stored in an online medium is comparatively difficult because there is a potential of cyber threats which can emerge anywhere in the world to put it simply cyber security involves defending computers servers mobile devices electronic systems networks and data from malicious attacks see cyber security is also known as information technology security or electronic information security note that the cyber attacks can emerge from both state and non state actors this is all about the brief background of cyber security now let's move on to see about the recent cyber attacks that took place in india see a few months back there was a huge cyber attack targeting the servers which holding the medical data of aims hospital nearly 3 crore people's medical records were encrypted as a result of this cyber attack note that the attack which was carried out on the servers of aims hospital was a type of ransomware attack here the term ransomware attack refers to a type of cyber attack which prevents the user from accessing the data which is stored in the computer once the data was encrypted by the cyber attacker he then asks for some ransom to decrypt the data see ransomware attacks are typically carried out using a trojan horse here trojan or trojan horse is the name given to a computer virus it is a type of computer software that is camouflaged in the form of regular softwares such as games and sometimes even antivirus programs so once trojan runs on the computer it causes problems like killing background system processes then deleting hard drive data and corrupting file allocation systems know that mostly trojans are introduced via email attachments and these emails are disguised in a way that they look authentic so once the user downloads the attached file and runs it the file starts corrupting the system and this is how the cyber attackers use this trojan to encrypt the data and once encrypted they demand for a ransom know that the recent aims attack was found out to be carried out by attackers belonging to china so this is not new to india few years back maharashtra state electricity board came under a cyber attack 
As a result of this attack, Mumbai city faced power outages. Like the Ames case, this attack also later found to be made by the Chinese attackers. See, these are the two recent attacks carried out by a foreign cyber attackers on our public digital infrastructure. Now let's move on to see about the recently introduced cyber security mechanisms in India to keep a check on cyber security related incidents. First comes the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team that is CERT-IN. See, it is the apex body in India to which cyber attacks are first reported. According to the new guidelines introduced in June 2022, it was mandatory for organizations which are operating in India to report cyber attack incidents to CERT-IN within hours of identifying the attack. This is about CERT-IN. Then the next framework is the newly introduced Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022. See, this new bill penalizes individuals and organizations which are involved in data breaches with a fine extending up to Rs 500 crores. So, these are the two recently introduced mechanisms in India to enhance the cyber security. Now, talking about the areas of improvement in relation to cyber security, see the total number of individuals who are involved in cyber security related domain in India is very less when compared to other countries. For example, India has only 3 lakh individuals operating in cyber security related domain whereas in USA more than 1.2 million people are employed in cyber security sector. So this is very less right. So lack of man force in cyber security related domain is the first issue. Secondly, private participation is also very low in India in cyber security related initiatives. Okay, These are the two problems associated with cyber security in India. So, the government of India needs to bring some more steps to bridge the gaps present in cyber security areas. Also, mechanisms have to be drafted to bring in more private companies in the field of cyber security in India. So, this is all about the India specific information about cyber security. Now, let's move on to see about the global scenario relating to cyber security. See, presently there are no major global cyber security frameworks which are anonymously accepted by all the countries. But there are two different processes established by UN General Assembly on the issue of cyber security. The first one is open-ended working group which was established by a resolution of Russia. Then the second one is the group of governmental experts which was established by a separate resolution passed by the United States. See, both these processes belong to the countries who are not coming together to develop an integrated single cyber security framework. Know that these two processes are differing vastly on many aspects of the internet including openness, restrictions on data flow and digital sovereignty. This is why the author feels that India should step in to conceptualize a global framework of common minimum acceptance for cyber security. This is to be done by bringing the issue of cyber security to the forefront during the meetings of G20. As we all know, G20 is going to be presented by India this time. So, this meeting is also utilized to frame cyber security framework. That's all regarding this discussion. This discussion, we saw about what is cyber security. Then we saw about the recent initiatives taken by India to deal with cyber attacks. And finally, we saw some points about the global scenario relating to adoption of common cyber security framework. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now for our next discussion, we are going to take these two news articles. One of them is a data point. The other article talks about a petition filed in the Supreme Court. See, this petition is to increase the marriage age of women from 18 to 21. But the Supreme Court dismissed the petition. This is because Supreme Court said that Parliament can only amend the law to provide uniform marriage age. This is about the news article given here. Now in this context, we will understand about the legislation for marriage age and we will also see some data given in this data point. Now let's get into the discussion. See, when it comes to marriage age, we should know about two acts. One is Special Marriage Act 1954 and the other one is Prohibition of Child Marriage Act 2006. As per these two acts, the marriage age for males is 21 and for females it is 18 years. See, recently, Prohibition of Child Marriage Amendment Bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha in December 2021. It proposes to raise the age of marriage for women from 18 to 21 years. Now, it was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee for more scrutiny. This is because the enforcement of the already existing laws is very poor. According to the data point, 
almost 23 percentage of women who are aged between 20 and 24 years married before their 18th birthday in 2019-21 particularly the share of eastern states such as bihar and west bengal this was over 40 percentage in assam andhra pradesh and rajasthan the share was over 25 percentage and the share was below 10 percentage in kerala himachal pradesh punjab and uttarakhand from this we can say that the high share of women who married before turning 18 years is very high. Due to this only 1050 cases were registered in 2021 under the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act. This data is according to the National Crime Records Bureau. This shows the poor enforcement of the law. Okay, With the recent arrests in Azam, the number of cases is expected to increase. Now coming to the bill, the Prohibition of Child Marriage Amendment Bill proposes to raise the age of marriage for women from 18 to 21 years. The problem here is that in India, over 60 percentage of women who are aged between 25 and 29 married before their 21st birthday in 2019-21. Here the shares of eastern states of Bihar and West Bengal was over 70 percentage and in Andhra Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Telangana and Tripura it was more than 65 percentage. So increasing age from 18 to 21 is also a problem. Now what should be done to rectify this problem? The best option to rectify this problem is providing education to women. See as per studies, better educated women have more control over when they should get married. Apart from this, education will provide awareness and better negotiation powers. And with awareness and better negotiation powers, younger women have postponed their marriage by many years compared to their mothers and grandmothers. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about problems with the existing marriage acts. Then we saw about the recently proposed amendment bill regarding the raise of age of marriage for women from 18 to 21 years. And finally we saw some solution to rectify the problem. Now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article here. According to the article Russia's membership in the financial action task force was suspended yesterday. This was done in reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So in this backdrop let us learn few facts about the Financial Action Task Force. See, Financial Action Task Force, which is shortly known as FATF, is the Global Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Watchdog. It was established in 1989 during the G7 Summit in Paris. Also know that FATF is an intergovernmental organization. Now coming to the objective of FATF, see initially its objective was to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering. But following the September 9-11 attacks on the United States, the FATF expanded its mandate to include efforts to combat terrorist financing. Apart from this, the FATF also works to stop funding for weapons of mass destruction. Okay? Now how does FATF works? See, FATF set international standards that aim to prevent the illegal activities like terrorist financing, money laundering, then funding for weapons of mass destruction, etc. Then as a policy making body, the FATF also worked to generate the political will that needed to bring in more national legislative and regulatory reforms in the areas of terrorist financing, money laundering, etc. In April 1990, the FATF issued a report containing a set of 40 recommendations. These recommendations provided a comprehensive plan of action that is required to fight against money laundering. Later in 2004, the Financial Action Task Force published a nine special recommendations. These recommendations further strengthened the previously established international standards for combat, money laundering and terrorist financing. From then, these recommendations were known as 40 plus 9 recommendations. Then later in 2012, the FATF revised its recommendations and expanded them to deal with new threats like financing of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Okay. Now talking about the jurisdictions of FATF, FATF currently has over 200 jurisdictions around the world. All these jurisdictions have committed to FATF recommendations through a global network of 9 FATF style regional bodies and FATF memberships. Now talking about the sessions of FATF, the FATF plenary is the decision making body of the FATF. So during its plenary sessions, the FATF considers mutual evaluation reports, policy and governance matters. Know that the FATF plenary meets three times per year. Now coming to the members of FATF, as of now, FATF is a 39 member body representing most major financial centers in all parts of the globe. Out of 39 members, there are two regional organizations, 
they are the European Commission and the Gulf Cooperation Council. The other members of FATF are displayed here. You can go through it. Now coming to India specific information. See India joined FATF as a observer in 2006 and India became a full member of FATF in 2010. So India is a member of FATF. Apart from this, India is also a member of FATF's regional partners like the Asia Pacific Group and the Eurasian Group. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about FATF, then we saw how FATF works, then we moved on to see about FATF's jurisdictions and finally we saw some facts about members of FATF. See this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question. This question is a previous year UPSC question which was asked in 2021 UPSC Civil Service exam prelims. Now I'll read out the question with reference to Madanapalli of Andhra Pradesh, which one of the following statement is correct? Here four statements are given. We have to choose which option is correct. See, it is a random question which was directly sourced from the Hindu article which was published on February 27, 2021. See, if you don't know the exact answer for questions of this type, it is better to leave them unattempted. But if you had read the article and made note of this fact, you could attempt the question. Now coming to the answer, as you can see from this image, the correct answer for the question is option C. See, Madanapalli is the place where Rabindranath Tagore translated National Anthem of India from Bengali to English. So the correct answer for the question is option C. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding Financial Action Task Force. Now look at this first statement. Every country is supposed to follow the standards set by FATF. Otherwise, it can be listed in FATF's black or grey list. See, this statement is correct. See, FATF plenary is the highest decision making body of the FATF. It meets three times a year to take stock on mutual evaluation reports of the countries it reviews. So, if a country appears to have major deficiencies in its anti-money laundering or combating the finance of terrorism regime, then the country is put on a list of jurisdictions under increased monitoring. That is none other than grey list. And if it fails to address FATF concerns, then it is put on a high risk jurisdictions list that is none other than black list. And know that a country is to be pulled out of the grey list, it has to fulfill the tasks recommended by FATF. For example, confiscating of properties of individuals associated with terror groups, etc. So, if the FATF is satisfied with the progress, it removes the country from grey list. So, as per this information, the statement one is correct. That is, every country is supposed to follow the standards set by FATF. Otherwise, it can be listed in black or grey list. Now, coming to the second statement, non-cooperative territories are placed under grey list of FATF. See, this statement is wrong. The grey list include countries that are considered safe haven for supporting terror funding and money laundering. And the grey list serves as a warning that the country may enter the black list. Whereas the black list includes non-cooperative countries or territories that support terror funding and money laundering activities. As of now, Iran, North Korea and Myanmar are the three blacklisted countries. See, Myanmar has been recently added to the list due to actions by military leadership after the 2021 aggressions. So, statement 2 is wrong because non-cooperative territories are placed under blacklist of FATF. Now, the question is asking for correct statement. So, the correct answer for the question is option A, one only. Now, let's take up the final question. Here, two statements are given. We have to find which of these two statements are correct. Now, look at this first statement. Lucer ecosystem is among the most ancient rainforests in Southeast Asia. See, this statement is correct. Know that the Lucer ecosystem is an area of forest located within the province of island of Sumatra in Indonesia. It is among the most ancient and life-rich ecosystems ever documented by science and it is a world-class hotspot of biodiversity. See, it is widely acknowledged to be the most important areas of intact rainforests left in all of Southeast Asia. Lucer ecosystem spans 2.6 million hectares and has a diverse landscape including lowland and mountain rainforests. And it is also having 185,000 hectares of carbon rich peatlands. This Lucer ecosystem has been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Site, and 75% of the world's remaining population of Sumatran orangutan is found in this Lucer ecosystem. Now, coming to the statement, Lucer ecosystem is among the most ancient rainforests in Southeast Asia. This we saw just now, this statement is correct. Lucer ecosystem is the most ancient rainforest areas. 
Now coming to the second statement, the ecosystem has been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Site. This also we saw just now, Lucer ecosystem has been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Site. So statement 2 is also correct. Now the question is asking for correct statement. So the correct answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.